So good morning to all of you, and thank you all for coming early morning. I'm really glad to see so many familiar faces, and of course faces I have not seen in the past year. So um, welcome to the second Horticultural Sciences Field Day. I'm Lekha Sridhar. I'm the Associate Professor and Chair of the Horticultural Sciences Program at Johnson County Community College. Um, as you know, Johnson County Community College has an excellent horticultural sciences program. The program was initiated in 2001 when a horticultural sciences certificate was offered. And then of course in 2006, we added a landscape technician certificate and an associates in applied horticultural sciences. We also have a two plus two articulation agreement with Kansas State University. And that's why we have Dr. Stuart Warren and several other speakers there is Dr. Rodney St. John just walking in. So we have several good speakers from K-State as well today. So currently we have more than 200 students enrolled in various classes and we have uh, approximately, I think about 60 to 80 students who will be graduating this year from our program. Uh, and our students, after they, uh, so after they graduate from here, they seek immediate employment in the industry and that's why this event is so important to us. And of course, some transfer to Kansas State University. They, are, they do it either immediately or down the road, or plan to down the road. Now, events like this, where there is such good representation from the industry, university, government agencies, and high schools, um, help us all work together and build positive relationships. In addition, this event is also a great opportunity for our students to network and explore career options. As can be seen from today's program brochure, which is this one here, as can be seen from today's program brochure, um, we have arranged a whole lineup of some excellent speakers to discuss a wide range of topics that are very relevant to tomorrow's horticulturist. I hope you enjoy each, and, uh, each one of those talks. And of course, my sincere thanks to all of those speakers. Some of, some of them have come from K-State. Uh, you know, they drove two and a half hours early morning from Manhattan, Kansas. So thank you all for coming. <laughs> I would also like to thank our generous sponsors, Hermes Nursery and Landscaping, uh, Ryan Lawn and Tree, Larry Ryan is right here, Suburban Lawn and Garden, JCCC's Center for Sustainability, JCCC's College Now, and JCCC's Center for Innovation. They, they sponsored by providing the funds to put this uh, event together. And of course, sponsorships will also be available for next year's uh, event as well. Of course, next year, this, this is going to be either the 15th of February or the 18th, because I think 16th is a Saturday. So we'll have to change it to a Friday or a Monday. Um, so, but, but we're going to have this even next year as well. So um, also my sincere thanks to all the people at JCCC who helped plan, organize, and execute this event in a timely manner. Their names will be listed on this TV monitor here. There are quite a few people, a lot of people in fact, and uh, you know, I, I'm not going to take this time to thank each one of them, but their names will be listed on the TV monitor here all day long. So once again, thank you all for attending today, and thank, thanks in advance to all the speakers who came here today, who will be here today, uh, and of course, uh, your suggestions on how to make this day better uh, will be, um, are very welcome. And this is the blue sheet. If you have time, once you're done, see, once we are done with all the talks, Please fill out the sheet, and then there's a box in front. So if you could drop, if you could, if you could please fold it. You don't have to write your name and give us your feedback. We would really appreciate that. Okay. So uh, once again, this blue sheet. Uh, we, you know, we have several of those at the front. Also, if you if you know of any speakers who uh, you know uh, who you think would be great for this event, please write their names down as well. Next, I would like to introduce two JCCC administrators who have, been, uh, who have really helped our program grow. They are in the next room. I, did, I was talking to them before I came here. I'm hoping they, are, you know, they can hear me because they are at the entomology table talking to Bob about the scorpions and all the, <laughs> and all the bugs out there. So uh, the two administrators are Dr. Sheila Daneski and Dr. Dana Grove. Dana Grove. Dr. Dana Grove is the executive vice president and the COO of Johnson County Community College. Uh, they both have really helped this program. You know, they both have provided um, you know, a, a lot of funds and uh, you know, whatever, we, whatever we have requested, they have provided. So I'm really grateful that they both are here to say a few words and welcome you today. Dana and Sheila, can you hear me? <laughs> it's not on in there. It's not on in there? No. So they didn't even know we started? 
Oh, that's why you couldn't hear me. Because I thought they should be here, but. <laughs> Sheila and Dana, can you hear me? Oh, so there was a glitch then, because this was supposed to be turned on there as well. OK. <laughs> yeah, they're both here. They couldn't hear us at the ne in the next room, so I apologize. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Dana Groh, who is Executive Vice President and CEO of COO, Chief Operating Officer at Johnson County Community College. Dr. Grove joined here in 2005, and like I mentioned before, he has been very, very helpful to our program. Uh, he has helped us tremendously, so I would invite, so I would really like to take this opportunity to invite Dr. Grove to say a few words and inaugurate this day, okay? Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Laika, and I think I'm going to emphasize the few words here. Um, we're very proud of our campus. Uh, we're very proud of the facilities and the landscaping and how well we keep it up here. And I'm sure you understand why we are uh, proud of it. Um, we're also proud of the 100-plus uh, programs, career and technical education programs we offer at the school, and in particular, the horticultural science program, because it really does model the kind of efforts that we like for all of our programs to, uh, to engage in. Um, and that involves collaboration. It collaborates with the community, the community businesses in helping our students get jobs in the field. It collaborates with governmental agencies in uh, providing assistance of all kind. And it collaborates with educational institutions, in particular Kansas State University, in curriculum design. And uh, once again, all this benefits not only the students, but also the community as well. Again, I, you haven't come here to listen to me go on and on and on. So at this point, I'm going to stop and I'm going to trade the podium off to Dr. Sheila Daniski, who is our um, Dean of Science. Sheila. Thank you, Dr. Grove. And welcome to all of you. We're pleased that you were able to make it out here today. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Stu Warren. So Dr. Warren received his PhD in horticulture and soil science from North Carolina State University and was there until 2007. And at that time, he moved to Kansas State University, where he is professor and head of the Department of Horticulture, Forestry, and Recreation Resources. So today, he'll be talking on water wars. Are you ready? And it's a pleasure to have him here. He's been a great supporter for uh, our collaborative program with Kansas State University and for our courses and our students who transfer there. So thank you, Stu. Hang on a minute, let's get all the technology on here. There we go. It is a pleasure to be here with you today to talk about the lifeblood of our industry. And our industry, of course, today when we talk about our industry, it's horticulture. If you're not in our industry, then you should be. I'm assuming everybody here has some interest in horticulture, even if it's just a personal passion. So what we're going to do is spend some time uh, at the next 45 minutes talking about water, how we fit into water, and the uh, working at a state institution. I'm not used to having a fancy room where we have dueling screens. Our classrooms, we have one screen that's right in front of us, so when I point at things, everybody sees it, so I don't know which way you end up going. I'm left-handed, so we may end up turning this way. <laughs> so we'll try to not leave anybody behind. Obviously, the same images, but we point some things out. So let's charge forward. When the well's dry, we know the worth of water. So when water becomes scarce, everybody steps up, and of course, we become concerned about water, but guess what? That's not a new thought. Benjamin Franklin said it in 1733. So the value of water has been known for a long time, but we've entered a new phase. Now we're hearing about blue wars. We used to hear about, not blue wars, blue gold, world water wars. Black gold, obviously, was referred to as oil. The big difference between water and oil, oil used to, we used to oil and natural gas. We sort of kind of always thought it was a finite resource as far as we were getting towards that. But in the last few years, we learned that might not be the case anymore. There's a, now they're talking about natural gas supplies in centuries, 
and oil in decades. The big difference in water is we're not going to find any more. Water is one of those, whatever law it is in physics, which I've forgotten more, more, as many times as I've learned it. Einstein may have said it. You know, you can't create it and you can't destroy it. There's X amount of water in the world, and it depends on who you believe, 1 to 2% of it is usable. So there's lots of water, but not a lot of it is potable, which is really our water doesn't have to be the best quality for the industry, but we can't use, obviously, saline water, salt water. That's most of the world. That's what it is, or it's in ice caps. Uh, so we have 1 to 2% of the world, and that truly is a finite resource. We're not going to make any more of it. And there's some, this is a pretty good uh, documentary as far as looking at water wars on a global basis. For about in the late 90s, we started gearing our research towards water. We had thought all along, and we for a decade probably said, water will be the oil of the 21st century. Where we're past that, it's time to replace it, is the oil of the 21st century, which means water is going to be driving. And this is a prediction from the UN, actually. It's quoted in the American Farm Bureau Federation by 2020. Ooh. That used to seem a long time away. It's not anymore. That water will be the source of conflict in the world. I think that's going to become true, whether it's 2020 or not, really becomes irrelevant. It's, it's a finite source as our population increases, our demand on our finite resource decreases, and we are tied to that resource, our industry. We're tied too tightly to it now, and that's actually what we're going to talk about today is how do we become more loosely dependent, not as tied as dramatically as we are now. Mark Twain said it best, this again back in the 1800s, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over. <laughs> now this was said, of course, he was on the east, east Coast, he was on the West Coast, and we've all, we've heard about water wars for years on the West Coast. There's lots of people, there's not a lot of water, everybody wants the same water in the Colorado River. The scary thing is it's, before I came here in 2007, which you heard, and we came from the south, we moved in the, to the south in the early 80s. We get 40 to 50 inches of rain, most of the south. Water issues was not a concern. No one thought about water. And there was about 2 point, about 3 million people, which is about the same as we are in Kansas, in the state where we lived in at the time. Time we left, there was 11 million people in that state. Everybody in the southeast, you may have known this, went ballistic. In the, in the 90s particularly, one city we lived in, 300 people moved there a day. So the demands on water, and then any time you got any kind of drought, any kind of pressure, it got ugly. And it's still ugly if you know water. And the Virginia folks are suing the North Carolina folks because they want their water. The Tennessee folks are, are suing the Atlanta folks because they want their water. There's, it's a finite resource. It's happening here in Kansas. This was just this past summer, Kansas fighting for water during drought. These are just screen sites. You can, uh, uh, particular soaring temperatures led to water restrictions in Kansas. Uh, these are not terribly unusual. We've seen those, particularly from the western part of the state. Let's move, though, more local. We're in the Kansas metro area, Kansas City metro area. So let's talk about this part of Kansas, not so much the West, which has always had water issues. Many of you may know we are now classified, the, the federal government classifies all states as either rural or urban. Kansas is a urban state, not a rural state, which means 80% of the people in Kansas live in the metro, metro areas, no, no longer in the rural areas. We have 342 students in our program. I bring greetings to you from them this morning. Very, very few come from rural backgrounds. We'd have to look for them. Very, very few. So if you think about them, what's referred to as a metro triangle, you turn to Kansas City. Those of us at K-State, we take that triangle clear over to Manhattan. <laughs> Whether it actually reaches to Manhattan, we could go to Salina. Then we come down to Wichita, and then we go back up. You're looking at 80% of the, the people in Kansas live in that metro triangle. The Kansas City metro area is, is projected to increase by a half a million by 2030. And if you translate that into water, that's an additional 50 million gallons a day. A day. Every day. And that's just for human use. The average human in the United States uses 100 gallons a day, which we could probably do better. 
some of the, of the Kansas City metro areas, though, they use 130 to 100, their cap per capita use is closer to 140. So we're using a conservative number here for 50 million extra gallons a day. The other thing which is interesting, the urban land use is projected to increase by 300%. And urban land use is just that. Where do we live in the metro areas? And that's the part that's growing in Kansas. The western part of the state, as everyone probably knows, is, is painful as it sounds, is really dying a slow death. Farms are getting bigger, families are getting older, schools are closing. It, it's not a good scenario. So 300% of urban land growth, and that's really city growth. How does that translate into water? And there's not a good translation, but let's use some numbers from the city of Olathe. And we're not picking on Olathe. They just have some really nice numbers on, the web, on their website. So if you search for water wars in Kansas, this is not a water war, but their website comes up and they give us some good value. So their numbers say 70% of the water usage in the summer is for lawn and landscape. It says outdoor use, but that's really us. That's our world, right? Now that includes washing your car and things like that, but it's pretty small. So if we take that 70% and the 300% urban land, and the urban land is, is typically where our world is. Usually we're tied to water. So we could expect that to go up dramatically. Well, we, we have issues, and don't we? <laughs> per capita use goes up. Humans are always going to go first, and then we're going to get remainder. So if we look at 70%, and let's look at, again, Olathe's water plan. It's in three stages as far as they have a water watch, and this is as water becomes limiting, and that's voluntary to try to cut back on, on uh, water use. They have a water warning, and that's where restrictions come in as far as time of day and how often you can water. And then they have, I was disappointed, they must have run out of W words. Water watch, water warning, water emergency. Wait a minute, that doesn't start with a W. Anyway, it's just thou shall not. If you get to the water emergency, is there are no irrigation. There is no irrigation. Uh, Back in late 90s, early 2000s, where I lived, we had a pretty serious issue. We got within 30 days of being out of fresh water. I'm talking about out. Shut down. Now, thank goodness it rained. But you can imagine the restrictions got to that point. There was, you couldn't, you could water by hand between like 5 and 6 a.m. with a bucket. That was it. The city actually said, don't buy any plants, don't plant anything. What do you think that did to the garden center business? The new plant installation, turf installation, like the people like turf specialists. It's your, your irrigation is locked shut. The boxes were locked. That was a real wake up call for the industry is, whoa, we better be thinking seriously. How can we disconnect ourselves from the, t as tightly as we are to irrigation? And, <laughs> The Olathe, and everybody else is too, is because of this 70%, obviously, they're focused on outdoor water use. That's what becomes restricted. When we say water restricted, water shut off, it's outdoor water use. There was, again, uh, the story, you forgive me for bringing old stories in, but it's, it's as relevant as I can be because we haven't had dealing with ugly, really ugly issues since I've been here in Kansas. There was a cola bottler, one of the big names, used to be, I've forgotten there. What, they live for life? Anyway, one of their, anyway it's, there's only two biggies, right? So one of the big colas, they bottled 400,000, they used 400,000 gallons a day in their bottling operation. And so our industry said, well, wait a minute, there's more industries using water than us. But the city council come back and said, well, we don't want those people to lose their jobs. And they employed 400 people. So what do you think we are, chopped liver? And we've got thousands of people tied to it. So that's the focus right now is... The outdoor water use, i.e. us, is that's where the water's being used, that's where we're going to recoup our losses. So people and industry, if there is a war, people and industry will be first, and it's not going to be the hort industry. Industry being animal slaughterhouses, if you're not familiar with it, uses thousands and thousands of gallons of water a day. So are we prepared to lose the war? Which means what if we if water becomes more limiting, are we prepared to survive as an industry? Will we be ready for less water? And this may be a little faded out, but that's okay. Basically, of course, the horticulture industry is very wide, very broad, right? So we do vegetable production, fruit production, and, and 
Kansas, I mean, think about it. We do pecan production. We have a big pecan industry. So it's very broad, right? Nursery, floriculture. But the biggest employer and the biggest part of our industry is landscape, which everybody else feeds into as well. So in that landscape, we're looking at as discretionary. And I would argue we're not. Quality of life is what we sell, right? Outdoor living spaces. Yes, we can live without our outdoor living spaces, but then we're urban again, remember? So a lot of rural areas, they don't spend a lot of money on landscape. They make their living on the soil, they don't want to come home and mow the grass, right? I don't want to come home and mow the grass, but that's a different story, right? So urban areas, though, and let's look at some of our really ancient societies, China, Japan, even England, they cherish their outdoor living spaces. Plants are revered. So I would argue that we're not as discretionary as people say that we are. You, you can live without us, right? You can eat and drink, but the quality of life. So we sell quality of life. And the way we sell that, of course, is with quality landscapes. That's what we sell. So what we're going to talk about today, then, for the rest of our time, is how to get by with less, less water. But the other issue is maintaining a high-quality landscape. Because we've got to go in tandem. We can easily get by with less water. Just turn it off, right? Ta-da, this is what you get. And if things get really ugly, so will our landscape. So we've got to be more savvy than that. We can't just, we don't want to just say turn it off. Not we don't anyway for our industry. So this is what we're going to talk about today is how to become, how to get that bullseye off our back. So we're not the, the industry there saying the only way to save water is to cut down on, is to eliminate, minimize outdoor water use. Well, we need to, to be able to be players on that and minimize our outdoor water use so we're no longer that 70% because that's a real easy target on our back. We could go to this, right? That's a water efficient landscape. It looked a little silly here, wouldn't it? We're not advocating that, so don't get too been out of shape. This is in southern Utah where it's a very xeric environment. This was a new subdivision. I, I used to teach landscape uh, management, so I was always looking for pictures. Something, because pictures tell a thousand words, and we was driving by this new development, and it's probably too light in here to see, but I drove by this house going, there's something funky about that turf. See, it may be too light to see. Can anybody see what it is? It's a rug. <laughs> it's not turf. <laughs> it's synthetic. So this landscape is truly water efficient. They've even went to the artificial playing service. So we're not advocating that. But what we do see is usually one of the first thing people jump to, if we want to have water efficient landscapes, and aha, we gotta, all we got to do is plant drought tolerant plants, and our problem is solved. Right? In fact, even some cities, good intentions, going to change their landscape in ordinance to provide builders with incentives to use drought tolerant plants. Well, let's step back one minute and look at what do we mean by drought tolerant plants? And let's first look at plants that are truly drought tolerant, zero fitting. Zero simply means dry, dry plants, right? Xeric environments tend to be 5 to 15 inches of rain a year. This is a xeric environment. These are drought tolerant plants. This is Canyonlands National Park. Southern Utah is the best kept secret in the United States. If you haven't been there, there's five national parks. Put it on your list between Bryce and Zion and Canyonlands and Arches, Capitol Wreath. Eh, there's four really good ones and Capitol Wreath. This is, anybody, everybody down here looks like they're old enough to remember the 2002 or three, maybe four, the hiker that was hiking by himself, didn't tell people where he was, and he got his arm wedged in a crevice and couldn't get it out and had to cut off his own arm and somehow lived. This is where he got lost. So he's just really lucky to be alive, because you can see they're not bothered by a lot of people. <laughs> uh, there's not, it's just an incredible place. It's a great place to visit. It makes you feel very small. True drought-tolerant plants have modified leaves. You can see here these thin string-like string -like are the leaves of this plant. Many of them don't have leaves at all. They have modified stems that are due for photosynthetic values, for, excuse me, for photosynthesis to uh, maintain the plant. This is a, most of the plants we don't recognize. This is an oak, you can tell by the leaf, and it's quite small, and it's got the thickness of a piece of cardboard. Uh, I mean, see, they're set up to minimize water loss. That's their whole focus. We don't want to lose any water. Also, if you could dig up them, which they're highly discouraged in our national parks, you would find most of the plant is below ground. 
well over 50% of it's below ground. Small tops, real large roots, which hopefully makes sense to us if we could make plants think. You'd want a large root. You want to be able to capture all the water that you can. This is a tough place to live, folks. If they could break free, which this one's about to, they'd run away, right? I don't, and I don't blame them. And also, this is a native landscape, obviously, low density, which means each plant has a lot of space. We're capturing water here, right? So modified leaves, if they have any leaves, large roots, small tops, low density. That's a true drought-tolerant plant. And this is uh, really close to Brian and Zeiss, the national parks. And this is people that have truly, no, I don't put this palm thing here. <laughs> the palm doesn't match very well, does it? But they truly have a drought-tolerant landscape. And then this one, again, is synthetic. This is actually real turf up here. So how does this apply to Kansas? Kansas is a mesic environment, eastern Kansas. Now, Kansas, of course, is a wonderful eclectic state. We're in this great transition zone between east to west, and it gets Southwest Kansas gets pretty close to that Zurich. It's almost in New Mexico, obviously, really close to that Zurich environment. But we're not Zurich. We're Mesic, which means typical years. We have a moist year. And if you look at the numbers for Kansas City, it's 40 inches a year. And you go down south of here, it could even it could push towards 50. So it's more similar to what we think of as in the south, really. So 40 inches a year is pretty moist. So if we take what would happen, if we take truly drought-tolerant plants, and move them to a mesic environment, most of them die, right? And it's disease that takes out most of them. It's just too darn wet. Now, there are some. I didn't plan this, but I took this, though. There's some yucca, some other things. And it's, there's a, that's what you live by the computer. I get play in. Come on, stop that. The, uh, this is a southern, in a southern uh, landscape where you get 40 to 50 inches of rain a year, and there's happened to be some yuccas and things. So some of the plants will transfer, but you've got to have, a landscape design for it. Most of us, you put some yuccas out in there going, what is, what is that? <laughs> this is not a desert we live in. So some of them do move, but most of them do not. So we have mesophytic plants. So our native plants are mesophytic. They're adapted to moist environments. And what does that mean? This is a woodlands uh, in Manhattan last year. So think about the, the mesic plants we have here, our native plants, right? They have large leaves. Thin leaves, not set up for xeric environment. If you could dig them up, large tops, small roots, less than 50% is below ground. High density, not low density. Again, these are native environments. These are not landscapes. So if we translate it to here, these are mesophytic plants. So they're set up, they have large tops, small roots, what else do we say? We've got high density and leaves that are set up for growing and less concerned about water <coughs> conservation. Come on, baby. So in a moist environment, water is not typically limited, so you have this by design. And this, we didn't do this, right? This is just what our plants do. So how do mesic plants deal with drought then? This is in July or August last year. It's, well, besides the heat, even if it wasn't really bloody hot, it is dry. It is the driest year we've had since we've been here. It was ugly dry, right? Well, this tree's been dead for a long time, so ignore that. <laughs> These plants are doing okay, right? They don't look. Doesn't mean they're happy about it, but they're cranking along. So with mesic plants, what do we have? We have two ways they deal with drought. One of them, it's the most straightforward, is called avoiders. They don't avoid drought, but what they do is they go dormant during drought. And our biggest, most common example is turf. Think about it as we go from east to west in Kansas, it moves from a temperate woodlands really to a grassland. So grasses are really well set up to deal with drought in real low income, low rainfall areas until you get really ugly, like into uh, southern Utah. They, grasses do a drought better than most of our other plants. And so these are the same woodlands you see here, but look at this here is the turf has always gone dormant. Now, again, it's too light in here to tell. I know that's crabgrass. You can see the seed head. So most of the green that you see is crabgrass. Weeds are tough. You've got to give them credit. <laughs> They're tough. 
So our turf guys have been looking at water a lot here recently, as you might guess, how to maximize efficiency or minimize water needs tried to high quality turf. This is a bluegrass study and there's lots, see all these little squares, so there's lots of different cultivars. This is a rain out shelter and so what happens within three seconds, I think it takes it to move, once a drop of rain hits the sensor, this goes out, so no rain. So this did not get rain for 60 days, a couple of years ago what they were looking at. And most of you see are, they're very dormant, some of them are still hanging in there for 60 days, pretty darn good. But then they turn the water back on, and you can't argue with that. Now, if it stayed really dry, turf is a miracle, they eventually, they would die if it, if it went on and on. But short-term drought, which is what we typically have. The other one that's interesting is bulbs, and a lot of the, and a lot of the bulbs we, we use come from a Mediterranean area, so it's six months wet, six months dry. And daffodils are a perfect example. We don't have six months wet, six months dry here, but daffodils don't know that. So they come up in the spring, they do their thing, they flower, they recharge their carbohydrate, recharge the, the mother bulbs, so they can flower next year, and then they go dormant as if they were getting ready to that six month drought thing. So a lot of our bulbs are really drought tolerant. The second time, and Besides turf and a few of our bulbs, most every other mesophytic plant you can think of is referred to as a tolerator. And these are my words I've made up, so these are not any real scientific words. Tolerator, just that. It's dry, I don't like it, but I'll continue to do the best that I can unless it gets really, really bad. And some things like river birches and some others, it gets really bad, right? You do see them shed their leaves, but most of the time, it's even last year, which is, it's pretty dry, so that some of it's been around longer than others. So think of the worst drought year you can think of, and your local, your, your local woodland has never been irrigated, right? And the trees and shrubs and stuff, I'm using trees here so they're a lot more visual, but most every other plant we're working on would be a tolerator. They go right about their business the best that they can. It doesn't mean photosynthetic rate doesn't drop down, stress doesn't come in, they do, but they don't dry up and blow away. So they're, they're adapted to short-term drought. So to me, it isn't about drought tolerant plants, it's what can we do then to maximize short-term drought tolerance because that's what our plants do. That's what they do best, is deal with short-term drought tolerance. And that, in a typical year, that's what we're going to have to deal with. So we're talking about, when we maximize short-term drought tolerance, what we're really talking about then is minimizing irrigation. But it isn't just that, right? We just turn off the irrigation if we want to minimize water use. We sell quality of life. We sell outdoor living stones. We sell aesthetics. So we have to maintain this plant quality or the, our value goes down dramatically, right? So what we want to look at is how are we going to minimize, how are we going to become less connected to irrigation and maintain our high quality plant. And this is the four areas we're going to focus on for the rest of our time. Maximize root zones, cultural practice, water management, plant selection, you notice is on here, but these are in order of what I would list as priority. Does that mean it's exactly that? No. So most of the things you're going to be seeing here today is based on science, but some of it's just downright opinion. This is an opinion. So plant selection is part of it but it isn't going to make or break our landscapes unless we're going to go with a desert environment and go with zero scaping, Z zero, see I did it. <laughs> Xeric scaping, which is dry landscaping, but sometimes referred to as zero <laughs> scaping where, because you do minimize the plants and it, it, isn't, uh, it isn't the landscape our clients want to deal with unless they're going to move to Arizona. This to me is the, the biggest key which we need to focus on. We need to maximize our root zone, what soil volume. That is the major key. So we need to be thinking more below ground. Are we setting up our plants to maximize that below ground volume? That translates into water, right? Just that simple. How drought tolerant do you think these plants are gonna be? Thank you for participating. Every time I look at this, I don't know whether it's a laugh or cry. Uh, because you can't make this up, uh, again, where we came from, the city passed an ordinance, you had to have so many trees for X number of parking spaces, they didn't, they didn't say how you had to do it, they didn't say they had to live, you just had to have trees. So, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, 
they come and knocked a hole in the, t in the asphalt and planted. Now, Bradford pears are tough, I'll give them that, but I don't think they lasted very long, I don't remember, to be honest. So obviously these plants are not going to be very drop tolerant, are they? This guy must be, a, must be brilliant, <laughs> whoever owns it, probably a great, uh, he probably is really good at operating the business, but he needs to get some help horticulture, what do you think? But you can look at other, particularly in our urban environments, anytime we limit root zones, the plant, unless, we, so we, we're really tied to irrigation. If we limit our plant, now this is, we're going to deal with turf last, okay? So every other plant you can think of, except for turf, we're not going to leave out turf, Rodney, you're getting nervous, I can see. We're not leaving, is tied to soil volume. Turf, obviously, with the fibrous root system, that's a whole other world, right? They can live in a real small volume. So we're talking about all the other plants that we have in the landscape. Maybe pansies would be another one. I mean, some of our annuals don't need a lot, but anything perennial. Here's some uh, shopping centers that must have gotten their advice to me. This is a stroke of genius. If you want to grow some trees and actually get tree size here, it was a soil volume. And heaven forbid, you can see there's no turf here. And low density. Here's another shopping center. Uh, again, it's high density, though, so they've set themselves up more for irrigation. Still some pretty good volume. So we can do stuff with our urban root zones, but we've got to be thinking bigger than a four by four foot. Or even now, we th a big one is six by six, right? That's not a lot of roots. If you look at construction sites, this is not a big stretch. Our construction sites, and this is not slamming contractors, the, the site is a staging area, right? So we know the landscape is going to be out there somewhere that you're going to inherit. So you need to have the capability to not only diagnose the problems, but how to fix it. Because if you simply, they're going to grade this off and give it to you. Right? Whoever got the bid on the landscape. So if you can't diagnose the problems and fix it, then you are going to be tied to irrigation. This is urban soils, and that's a real polite word we use to, to talk about the crap that's left there after construction. And if you've planted much in the landscape, then you, it, this is not too far of a stretch. I mean, you can find concrete right, you can find bricks. I found uh, saw blades, right? You probably you find all sorts of anything that they can cover up, you inherit it. So this is uh, an urban site. This is the original soil profile from down here down. And you can see this was brought in as fill, no charge for the rocks. And uh, so that's what you would be, and they did literally just plant into it. Probably didn't guarantee the plants. So urban soils got lots of problems. They lack structure. They're compacted. They're poor drainage. They have pH nutritional problems, low biological activity. And don't need to beat you over the head if you're in here and you've had any kind of training you know of that. Urban soils is a real problem. So if you don't have the capabilities to diagnose problems and fix it, make sure that you hire somebody that does or get those, because you're going to become very powerful in your company. The other thing we can do is minimize competition. And this is not, uh, I am not an anti-turf guy, OK? I'll show you my landscape before we're finished here. And I'm, my turf is right in there. But, Turf roots and every other kind of root you can think of were not meant to be side by side. That's not the way, can we say that? God planned it. It's not the way our native ecosystems are. You don't mix and match. The buffalo is just there for effect. But turf lands, you see it most of the time, is just dense expanses of turf. And they do really well that way. This wouldn't be called turf. This would be grasslands, right? Grasslands are turf. So they do really well. They're very competitive, though, for nitrogen, for water. And so if you put them in, here's the root system, so much different than all our other plants have much broader root systems. They're much more open. They're not as compact. So they don't do well against turf. Turf is going to win. So if we put, and this is, again, trees, for example. Well, you can put any plant you want it into. So if we put our trees surrounded, and this is totally up to the tree itself. So you also got mower and weed whacker issues. So if we put... Trees and turf in the same environment, young trees bed on the turf. Turf's going to win with water and nitrogen. Large trees, huh, flips, doesn't it? Tree winds, shade, water competition. How many of your clients have said, I want turf underneath my large trees? Why don't we just jump off this building and be less painful, right? I mean, so, there's, so it doesn't work really well. So what we need to be thinking on is separate root zones. 
it's not rocket science. It's separated so we manage separate root zones. Nutrition, turf needs a lot more nitrogen than most every other plant in the landscape. And water, turf needs more usually than most every other plant in the landscape. This is not a good and bad, it's just the way life is. And here's a good example, and this was done years ago at the Morton Arboretum. They drew plants surrounded by grass. Sorry, I'm just using one screen. And grew plants uh, where the soil was mulched. And these are the roots that they found underneath the square foot and dug it down. Again, this is not good and bad, it's just grass is real competitive. So they are going to limit your root system, which means you're going to have less drought tolerance. And we got to do better. I mean, this little donut here probably does good for weed whackers and for mower injury, but it's not doing a lot for the tree, right? So we need to do better. And it would make our life a whole lot easier, too, from the standpoint of maintenance, mowing. And trees and shrubs usually like to be, you think about it, we're going to look at their, their ecosystem. They like to be grouped together, don't they, old forester, ex-forester here and Larry? They like to be grouped together. So closer we can do to replicate their native environment, the less stress there's going to be. In urban environments, there's always stress. I tell my students, there are no stress free. It's kind of like us. Even on our best day, we're not stress free. Typically, we have varying amounts of stress. Well, in urban environments, there's always some stress. It's not stress-free, so all we can do is try to minimize. And one thing we can do is group our plants together in similar ecosystems, and we're going to mix and match. You're not going to have a, a, an ecosystem where you don't have turf, or it's highly unusual not to have turf and every other kind of plant in your landscape. So if we want to minimize problems, again, with short-term drought, minimize, minimal problems with adequate soil volume, increasing soil volume increases drought tolerance. It's pretty much one-to-one. -one. The more exploitable soil volume they have, the more drought tolerant they're going to be. Okay, what, are the, what, are, what else can we do? And again, we're trying to replicate environments. We don't have to do it with turf, is, is grasslands. You know, that is a separate environment. But every other plant you can think of lives in more of an environment like this. We don't intermix the two. So all the herbaceous perennials you can think of, all the trees and shrubs you can think of are more similar, not as clean as this, obviously. This is really clean, you're not going to have that, but we don't mix and match. You don't find, except for eastern red cedar, you don't find most of these plants within grasslands. Eastern red cedar has this incredible ability to survive in a grassland. And if you take the mulch back, again, this is a little, the, the roots are right there. That's another myth we need to get over. Tree roots are not deep. The real active roots are pretty darn shallow and they're right there in the turf root zone. Now they may be deeper if you've got a good soil volume, but think about it, the water and oxygen that's required and the pH on the nutrition, as you go down, the worse it gets. It's the surface where things are happening, particularly with summer rains and aeration. So they're not, they're not deep. So it doesn't make any difference what kind of mulch. Again, being from the south, you've you got to show pine straw. Inorganic, organ these are these Oh, people like them or hate them, these painted, stained, uh, shredded pallets, and get them in red and black, and uh, <clears throat> you can have your own opinion about those. So back to here. So again, we need to be thinking about separating our root zones. Does that mean all our trees are going to, we're going to have trees that are going to be surrounded by turf, and what we think about, if I've got my pictures here, of course, what we don't want is that. Ideally, what we'd want and again, these are houses real close to the other ones I've taken. Here's your separated root zone. Here's your turf root zone. This is not very aesthetic, but it gives you the picture here. We've got separated root zones for everything but turf, and our turf root zone runs down the middle. Ideally, it would be to the drip line, because that's where most of your active roots are. Ideal. I know you're not going to have clients that aren't going to think that's a really great idea. So the good news is, and this is research-based, as small a circle as three feet helps tremendously. And, no, and that's besides the mower and weed whacker damage that you're going to minimize. Four feet is really good. So you don't have to have huge areas. This is actually at the Mall of Washington, D.C., and it's really re well done. Uh, but again, it's a lot of isolated. Uh, maintenance and I mean as far as it adds to the time you're gonna to have to circle each one of those why don't we think about when our designs grouping our plants together and do more okay here's my tree root zone I'm using trees to do everything but turf obviously here's my tree shrub basis perennial root zone here's my turf root zone separate them into beds 
So what else affects size of root systems is, and nitrogen and water? And again, this is not saying don't, when we're looking at it here, it's not saying don't use nitrogen. Use the nitrogen that is recommended, but if you get real nitrogen happy, which we can, or if you've got trees and shrubs surrounded by turf, turf, and <clears throat> I tried that, you cut back on the nitrogen below the recommended rate, the turf quality goes <laughs> I mean, there's a good reason the rates are recommended to what they are, to keep the quality up. But most of everything else that we have doesn't need that much nitrogen. And the roots are all intertwined, so if we can separate them. And so the higher the nitrogen rate that you get, decreases the size of the root system. And work with me here, I know these look like very mature trees here. The, uh, again, it's not that the root systems don't increase in size, but the top increases so much more dramatically than the root system. It's just phenomenal for nitrogen. Not for turf, but for most everything else you can think of. So you can get this really big top, small root system. Does that sound like what we want to be drought tolerant? Nine, right. And so here's a good example. This is a five-foot tree grown in a quart container. You know what a quart is, right? This, this. So if you keep pumping nitrogen and water to it, you can get a real big top. Now, this is a silly example, obviously. But it, the point is you can get a real big top, small root system. So if you get nitrogen happy, you're moving backwards. It's interesting that water has the same impact, although much more minimal. Nitrogen is the big dog in the landscape as far as impacting plants. It's nitrogen. You can over-irrigate, um, and you tend to get bigger tops and smaller roots. Still, and think about it from the standpoint of the tree, the top and the root try to stay in some kind of balance. If you increase the root's ability to pick up nitrogen and water, and that's the two big drivers, then you can drive a large top because the root's got access to about everything it needs, water and nitrogen. Turn that water off, and you still got a big top, smaller root. May adjust, probably won't though, probably die. So mulch, minimize nitrogen and water, and I don't want to say we're minimizing nitrogen, and use, the, use the recommended rate, just don't get nitrogen happy. Minimize your competition. Talk about density. And now we're talking about turf, and again, we're not wanging on either side here. Turf with young stuff, turf's going to win. Turf is very competitive. If we can separate those root zones, our life becomes a whole lot easier. And then the other thing when you think about is density. As far as looking at separating, this is once we've already seen, great examples of separating root zones. Here's again, the trees are going to stand alone, the larger you, root zone that you can get your client to buy into as far as mulch. It doesn't always have to be in beds, but I think as far as maintenance and long term, just your cost, it's a whole lot easier to maintain, do one trip around a bed that's got multiple trees or shrubs in it than it is to do where your guys get vertigo, nausea, doing circles. The other thing is the higher the density, and this is not saying this are good or bad, it's just something you need to be conscious of particularly if you're designing, the higher the density, the more likely you are to be tied to irrigation during short-term drought. Because the what demands for water go up directly proportion to the density. Come on, baby. There we go. Water management. So we're not, what we're trying to do here with today is think about how to re reduce that 70%. Not eliminate irrigation. There's some short-term drought with maintenance. I don't think that's possible, excuse me, with maintaining a high quality, I don't think it's possible to totally disconnect ourselves, but we don't want that target on our back going, you guys use most of it, we're going to turn off your tap. So water management, how much, how often, <clears throat> something that we tend to forget about, we think we're watering plants, we're not really, we're watering soil. Plants take water from the soil. So you need to be thinking about how do I replace the water in that soil, which gives access to that plant. And there, we'll just look at, obviously, sandy soils and clay soils, loamy soils split the difference. Sandy soils, and it's not rocket science, don't hold a lot of water. The blue is water. The, the red is aeration. They don't hold a lot of water. They hold a lot of aeration, hold a lot of oxygen, which is great. So they're easy to manage, really. You can't over-irrigate mostly sandy soils. Clay soils, on the other hand, if you have a drought situation, clay soils can be your friend. They hold a lot of water, but not a lot of aeration. So during a drought, your clay soil becomes your best friend. If it was too wet, though, what one year was it, 2007 or 8, when we, first, when we first got here? I think it was 8. We couldn't turn it off, at least in Manhattan. We had plants dying from uh, Phytophthora. 
because it was so bloody wet, we couldn't stop the rain, and so the soil stayed too wet. Phytophthora, of course, explodes when it's wet, and we lost some plants, and not much we could do about it. So, and that kind of clay wasn't our friend. Usually about an inch of water a week, even for, even for turf. I mean, we're talking about maximum here, and, and turf usually is what we're looking at for is maximum. Most of the time, your trees and shrubs and everything else don't need that, but we're thinking about clay soils with about an inch of water once a week. Again, they hold a lot of water. They don't have a lot of oxygen, so whoops. Sandy soils, on the other hand, the, the plants still need that inch of water a week, but you can't, if you put it all at one time, you're going to go dry. So simply got to think about what soil my water and the plant the water volume doesn't change that much for what the plant needs, but the storage and aeration changes dramatically. The other thing too, clay soils are tough to irrigate. Everybody should be familiar with, with cycles, right? Well, you got to cycle it on. If you try to put on your inch all at one time, depends on the flow rate of your heads. Particularly uh, uh, if the rotors is probably you can go a higher f uh, rate, but if they're just the pop ups, that rate gets very high. Most of your water is going to end up like this one here running down the slight slope here over the curb and away it goes. You need to be thinking about how do we cycle it, get it into that. You can't just put it all at one time. The other thing too for is if you've got mixed and matched, this is going to tax your skills as a horticulturist. This is just going to show you how good you are because you're going to be balancing this. You're going to be walking a very fine line between probably keeping high quality turf and keeping some everything else from going anaerobic. This is, I went by this site <clears throat> every morning, 6.30 a.m., the irrigation was running. Let the waters flow. Well, this is, again, unfortunately, it's too late to see here, but this is your new low-maintenance, or no-maintenance oaks. No leaves to pick up there. They're dead. So one, two, three, four, all the oaks <laughs> were dead. Irrigated, death by irrigation, basically. The maples, everybody knows, hopefully everybody knows that maples are very tolerant of wet soils. They were still doing their thing. Oaks are not tolerant of wet soils, most of them anyway. They were not doing their thing. Don't know what was here in these gopher holes, this subdivision, but you could drive around, gopher hole, gopher hole, gopher hole. They were all ornamental brown, I'm sure, before they were yanked out and went to the great garden in the sky. They're dead. Waters are flowing, though. You can see here the turf looks pretty darn good. So. You can over-irrigate turf because turf, that start at the bottom here, can tolerate a half a percent of oxygen. That's just unheard of. Turf is so darn tough. Every other plant, though, if you look up here, 3 to 5 percent to survive for growth by, and this is oxygen now, 12 percent. So see this huge disconnect here. But again, it's another excellent reason to separate your root zones. Your life is going to be much, so much better, and you're going to get quality. It's going to be so much easier to maintain your quality. You're going to be a heck of a horticulturist to manage those two. And it's done all the time. But you've got to be really conscious of over-irrigation. Turf can take it. Most everything else cannot. If it ever gets to hand watering, it's tough for hand watering. This is actually a real sandy soil. And even the real sandy soils, you see this water flow here. But really what I want to look at is assuming if we can disconnect. I would advocate most everything but turf, we can disconnect pretty much from irrigation. But we need to have something probably to fall back on or newly installed, and that's why these gator bags are the best things in sliced cheese. And yes, there was a University of Florida graduate <coughs> gator bags that uh, named them as well, although they're not produced in Florida, they're produced in North Carolina. <laughs> that they're 20 years life. You can go, most people, many teams don't go back and get them, but they'll last forever. You can remove different strips in the bottom and, and uh, control the drip rate. So you go by with your water truck, you fill it up, boom. It's just that quick, you walk away. The other one, though, which is it's coming common, but I don't see it a lot here in the Great Plains, is called vertical mulching. And it's, some, it's slotted drainage, four-inch slotted drainage style that you install with the tree when you put it in. So you've got to put that in your bed. And this one actually has a sock around it, so you can knock the tops off. There's either three or four here. You can see three, knock the tops off. Got your water truck, fill it in. And again, it won't work in sandy soils because your water's going to go, right? Clay soils will go lateral. So clay soils, you've got your instant slow release water that you have to go back during really ugly times because you don't a lot of our folks again in the south now are putting in landscapes or irrigating the turf they're not putting irrigation in on the other material but they are doing some of the real if you've got a 200 hundred dollar tree in there that you've guaranteed they're putting some of these in because it's just it's a cheap investment so if they had to to go back they can fill it in and this is what they look like 
uh, when they're, before you put the plant in them, again, this doesn't have the sock on them, so it might silt up. This is not a new thing. This is in Australia. And the, the Aussies and the Europeans tend to use more of a snake-like where they wrap it around the ball so you only see one top. This, to me, is some serious ugly, but uh, the French, what are you going to do with them? This is actually in, in Paris in a new planting, and it's tied to that tree. I mean, is, does anybody else think that's, that's ugly, right? It's, it's seriously ugly. Why not cut it off at the base and put a cap on it? Because Americans are doing it right. Is it French? You can't tell them a thing, can you? But anyway, so it's not terribly uncommon so if that's something you haven't considered and you've got to build it into your bid and it's there forever. Uh, you can go back anytime. Lastly, plant selection. And we're just about finished up here. There are some plants, if you like hydrangeas, then bless your heart. You're going to be tied to irrigation for the rest of your life. <laughs> hydrangeas is the most... Anybody here sell hydrangeas? Then you'll forgive me. The most overrated, oversold, never flowers like it's supposed to once you leave the nursery. And all it does is wilt, right? <laughs> you turn around and look at it, it wilts. <laughs> you silly. So it wilts even when there's plenty of water there. So I don't, I don't have much to say about my branches. Uh, that, <clears throat> there was a real ugly drought several years ago. We were 15 inches down for the year. 15 inches. And it got to the point where you either hand, you hand water with a bucket or you didn't water at all. So I said, some of my plants, you're on your own, some of them. This Japanese maple, I'd grown it from a seedling. It was like one of my children, but still, you're on your own. So we wanted to see what it'd do, because most people would think of Japanese maple. It's not, probably not real drought tolerant. But if you look at it, it got some pretty serious ugly for the end of the summer. Uh, but come next spring, full leaf, thank you very much. Now, if we'd had that for two or three years in a row, we probably would have seen some decline. So the whole point being, most of our mesophilic plants are pretty darn drought tolerant. Of course, selling your client that this maple is OK is another. Of course, if they turn the water off on you, that's what we had. You either water by a bucket or you don't water at all. That's when the, the clients become a whole lot more interested <laughs> in uh, how do we disconnect ourselves from irrigation. So it was a wonderful, wonderful teaching moment that we had. And it changed the industry. We, they didn't ever go back, I don't think, as far as to the pre, we got 30 days of water left. Xerophytic plants, again, for plant selection, there are a few, but they don't really fit in our environment unless you're doing a desert landscape. If we want to disconnect ourselves from irrigation, I shouldn't say disconnect, reduce our dependence on irrigation so we're no longer labeled with you all use 70% during the summer months. That's hard to argue with, folks. It's, it's easy to see why they focused on us, even though they may not say the horticulture industry. They say outdoor watering. They might as well say it's the horticulture industry. Then we've got to do a better job of making sure we've got adequate root zones. Again, we minimize our nitrogen and water. Minimize, maybe not eliminate. And then the other thing with, that I like to use is an indicator, of course, with turf. If you walk on it, if it doesn't, you, I got this right, Donald Rodney. If you walk on it, it doesn't bounce back, or your footprint stays, there's an impression that some signs. OK, so that's the easy one for turf. What about everything else? So if you go out and check your plants at 2 and 3 in the afternoon, and you see some that are wilted, I wouldn't think a thing about it, because many times the roots can't keep up with the demand, particularly for things like hydrangea. So check them early morning. If you're not an early morning type, you can still do as late as 8, 9 o'clock. Usually it's 10 o'clock before things really start getting cranked and photosynthetic-wise. And so if it's not wilted, early morning, it's good, because most of our plants use overnight to recover. So if it's wilted early morning, though, and then the next morning you go back out and it's still wilted, that's what I use as a flag. Is <clears throat> and of course, you can feel them through their flashes. I mean, they're, they look really pitiful. That's how you use the flag, is we're really close to starting to lose quality and begin to think about irrigation. Again, don't pick hydrangeas. <laughs> pick a plant that you know is a little on the, a little more. So there are some varying degrees of drought tolerance, but there's not a huge degree. Hydrangeas is the one that really screams, I'm not drought tolerant. So, now let's end up with the 800-pound gorilla in the room. And if I'm going to step on some toes, this is probably going to be it. So we need to be thinking about what's called practical turf areas. Well, what in the world we mean by that? In my opinion, in the long term, these huge, large turf areas that we have now that, that are 
that are irrigated. Now, if they're not irrigated, we already said how drought tolerant turf is. It's very drought tolerant. Most of our clients, though, are on in this income level here, and they're not real keen on saying, yeah, I'm going to let my, unless, but, but, but we've got a green thing going. We've got a sustainable thing going. I think as an industry, we need to be capitalizing on that and say, let's pick out some areas that we're going to maintain real high quality for you and also designate some areas that we're going to allow to go dormant if it gets really dry. I think a lot of our clients would go for that now. It makes them green. Green is cool. Again, th this is the issue. I mean, this, these plants, uh, this turf here came back very nicely and probably has went through a gazillion drought cycles over the last 20, 30 years. This is, uh, obviously, we can get this way, but this is not what we're advocating. More something similar to this as far as, you know, here's your everything but turf root zones here. Here's your high quality turf. Usually that's going to be focused on in the front of the house if you're going to have high quality. I use my own landscape as an example to uh, reinforce that I am a, a not a turf Nazi as far as uh, now obviously this all none of this was here when we bought the house it was just all turf as you might expect so anyway we delineated beds in the front and back that's everything but turf goes in there our irrigated turf is in front it's got to look good it, it, not if it doesn't look good it kind of detracts from everything else so uh, but again we focused takes them about 10 minutes to mow it, and that's 10 minutes that I begrudge every week. I'd like about three minutes. But the wife says, you can't spray out any more turf, dear. So we're looking for that aesthetic area. This, when my son was young, he, uh, we were driving around to be a landscape like this. Our oldest, he was around six. He said, it'd be hard to play in that yard, wouldn't it, Dad? So obviously, we have practical reasons to have turf. If you've got children, it's hard to play in a woods without hurting yourself. Try playing baseball, soccer, football, golf without turf. But we have functional areas that require turf. Some of our areas for erosion control, turf just makes the most sense. So we need to be thinking, though, how can we use practical turf areas rather than just large expanses of turf? This is my personal opinion that water wars will catch up as we continue to grow, if we're projected to, to the Great Plains. It's already happening in Texas. I'm not sure about Oklahoma. So it's going to happen to the eastern half of Kansas. So how can we position ourselves to be ready for this as an industry so we, our income isn't slammed by water restrictions or even worse, water shutoffs? Okay. Because up and standing, so I think my time is up. <laughs> now, in my defense, I think I was less than an hour, wasn't I? Okay. So the older I get, the more chattery I get. That's the problem. I don't know if you found that, Larry. Maybe you got more stories to tell <laughs> the older we get. Any question, comment? Oh, a drip. I actually took that slide out. I was trying to whittle it down. You know, drip is a no-brainer. So, yeah, it was in one of the, but you can't, yeah, I've already been, it's too windy. Uh, so, no, drip is, is any, everything but turf, but even there's good irrigation going on with drip, even with turf and some of our corn. Believe it or not, in the western part of the, of the Kansas, our agronomists are looking at drip, subterranean drip for corn, subterranean drip for turf. That would be a huge leap forward and may become economical if our price of water keeps going. Uh, but Dr. Rodney St. John, he's our turf guy. He can answer some of those questions this afternoon as well. So again, it's not a matter of either or. It's just how do we manage, do a better job managing what we have. So I mean, I think the future of our industry, based on countries that are a whole lot older than we are, is great. I think you've picked a great industry to be in if you're just up and coming. If you're in it, you already know it. I think you make a good living and uh, thoroughly enjoy horticulture. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.